and can be dismissed. And, and afterwards, you have to go to the other building to pick them up. Oh, yeah, there you go. What's going on? Yes, mom and dad, pick up your kids at the youth campus. Do you guys ever run to get into the sanctuary the way that they run to get to their class? <laughs> we got to change some things up, man. We got to have like candy or something to get people in. Well, uh, it is good to be here tonight. Um, we're going to be looking at the book of Jonah. And uh, <clears throat> as we study through this, <laughs> it it's it's a fun book and it's yet one more place where the Lord has had me teach because I needed to hear it for myself. And uh, so hopefully this, uh, this short study will be something that will reach all of us and that we will um, that we'll hear the Lord giving us direction and correction um, and exhortation as we study together. So Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that your word is alive. It is not a dead book. Lord, it is something that is the very breath of God. Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that allows us to understand the things of you. Lord, without your Holy Spirit, we would be completely hopeless. And so, Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would meet here with us, that you would allow us to understand the things that we hear from your word. And Lord, I pray that you'd use me, Lord, and uh, Lord, that I would be yielded and submitted to your will and that I would say the things you want me to say and that I would be quiet when you want me to be quiet. So be with us tonight. In your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I've got a little bit of a tickle in my throat. Jonah was a prophet. Um, we know that. In 2 Kings 14.25 it says this. It says, He restored the territory of Israel from the entrance of Hamath to the Sea of the Arabah according to the word of the Lord of Israel, which he had spoken through his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from Gath Hefer. Jonah was a man of God who ministered in the area of Israel down into Judah. And he had a, a ministry that was taking place at the same time as the prophets Amos and Hosea. Okay, another couple guys, they were contemporaries of each other. Um, we don't know if they'd go down to the coffee shop and talk doctrine, but, but they would have known each other. It was, a, it was a small circle. And so he was working during this time. Now, we don't know much about Jonah outside of the one reference in 2 Kings and these four chapters of the book of Jonah. <clears throat> Jonah is considered a minor prophet, not because he was digging for gold or because he was a small guy, but rather because the story of Jonah, it's, it covers four chapters and it covers one specific event in time, okay? You have a, a ministry um, covered in this book that would have taken place within, at the most, several months, okay? You go to, a, to another book such as Isaiah and that would have covered approximately 40 years. So that's the difference between a minor prophet and a major prophet is the minor prophets, we only have a small bite-sized piece of their entire ministry. But we know that Jonah ministered for a period of time, but we are only going to be looking at a very small piece of that time in his life. The book of Jonah was, it took place somewhere right around 760 B.C., okay? So 760 years before Christ. Um, Jeremiah had prophesied that the king of Israel, Jeroboam, would recapture Damascus. At this time when he is, he is ministering, you have the nation of Judah, okay, and you have the nation of Israel. Israel and Judah were this, had separated off. The tribes had separated into the ten northern tribes, which made up Israel, and the two southern tribes, which made up Judah. And he was ministering during that time, and Jeroboam was the king of Israel of those 10 northern tribes. And when, when Jonah prophesied, Jeroboam took him at his word and went back into the Damascus area and was able to reclaim territory that had been taken away from Israel. 
And the reason why he was able to do that is because there was another nation on the scene, and this was the nation of Assyria. Now, the Assyrians, they were a warlike people. They, <laughs> they believed in total warfare all of the time. That was how, how they grew their nation. That's how they brought in their revenue. It was through war all of the time. And Assyria had gone up against Damascus and had defeated Damascus. And so it left this, this void where Israel was able to go back in and repossess part of the land that had belonged to them. Assyria was a, um, it was a major, major player in those days. It had been around for a long time, but they were experiencing a growth spurt. They had discovered how to form iron tools and weapons. And iron um, compared to bronze tools, which were the weapons of the day, there was no comparison. It was like you know, taking a, a rifle to a, to a knife fight or something like that. The bronze tools couldn't stand up against the, um, the iron tools, and they could mass produce those things, whereas the bronze tools had to be made one at a time. And so they had a, a strategic advantage, plus their desire to make war made them a very, very powerful foe in that area. So <coughs> picking up in verse 1 of chapter 1 of Jonah, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. The Lord says, Jonah, I've got a task for you. He says, I want you to take a little road trip. I want you to go visit the folks, the Assyrians that live in Nineveh, and I want you to preach to them. Now, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. Okay, Nineveh was an incredible city. It was the largest city in the world at that time. Approximately 120,000 people lived inside the walls of the city. It was a huge, huge undertaking, and it was something that no one else could compare with. Um, in fact, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon is, is assumed that they actually started there in Nineveh, that they were actually built originally in Nineveh, and that when um, Nebuchadnezzar built the Hanging Gardens, he was actually building onto something that the Assyrians had already started. And so we have this incredibly strong, powerful, big city, and it was about a 700-mile journey from where, <laughs> from where Jonah was ministering. It wasn't part of Israel. There weren't a bunch of Hebrew people living there. And most of the time, when we look at the at the guys that were acting as prophets in the land of Israel, they were ministering within the confines of Israel to travel 700 miles, you know, maybe a month-long journey to go minister in a place full of warlike people would not have been appealing. It wouldn't have been something that I probably would have wanted to do. Now, the ruins of Nineveh are located on the edge of the Tigris River. Okay, so if you, if you can picture in your mind modern-day Iraq, and you go north, there's a city called Mos Mosul. Mosul, okay? Okay, we've heard about that in the news. That city is growing over the remnants of Nineveh. Nineveh was located right there. And so it was, it was quite a ways away and um, was something that, that Jonah probably was not expecting to be called to go and minister inside of. So verse 3, it says, But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, and he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So here we've got this guy. His name is Jonah. He's a prophet of God. He is somebody that hears the word of God and then shares it with the people. He's prophesied for the king of Israel. And the Lord tells him to do something, and he says, yes, sir, I'm on it. No, he does not. He says, I'm not doing that. I've got a plan. I'm going to Tarshish. I'm going to run away. Does this sound familiar to anyone here? Don't raise your hands. I can tell you it's familiar for me. There's times where the Lord has told me, hey, I want you to do this. You know, I'm stuck on an airplane for like 11 hours. And there's a guy next to me, and the Lord's like, hey, I want you to talk to him. And I'm going, no, I don't want to talk to him. I don't want to talk to him. 
you know, here I am, I'm traveling to the other side of the world to go do missions work, and I don't want to talk to the guy right next to me, <laughs> you know? I'm trying to rest right now for this, you know, for what is coming. Yeah, and the Lord does this in our lives where he gives us opportunities to minister on his behalf. And a lot of the time, it doesn't sound like a lot of fun. Fear is involved, uh, discomfort. Um, <laughs> it just isn't something we want to do. So here I am. I'm studying the word of God. I'm teaching the word of God. And I struggle with this very thing. No, none of us <laughs> is above um, trying to run away when the Lord calls us to do something. You know, the last thing that Jesus commanded his followers before he ascended to heaven. Anybody remember? Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things as, if I, as I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. See, so we are called, we are tasked with sharing the Lord with those around us. For some of us, it's, it's that primary gifting. It's the thing that the Lord has given us, and we can't help it, but we are out preaching on the street corners all the time. And then there's guys like me, and you know, I can be in front of all you guys, and I can teach and have my, my stool and have my, my Bible and be, be good to go, but man, you put me on a street corner, and I'm just like, huh, do you know Jesus? You know, I, I'm scared half to death. And yet that is what the Lord has called us to do. Even if it isn't, what we would consider to be our primary gifting. Now, back to the text. If you're familiar with the book of Nahum, everybody studied Nahum, right? We've got it all memorized. Everybody, everybody's good? So if I say Nahum 3, you guys can just start quoting it for me. So Nahum 3 describes the city of Nineveh. Okay, so let me, let me read this for you. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 4, it says, Woe to the bloody city! It is full of lies and robbery. Its victims never depart. It means that if you're a victim, you're dead. You're not leaving. The noise of the whip and the noise of rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of clattering chariots, horsemen charged with bright swords and glittering spears. There's a multitude of slain, a great number of bodies, countless corpses. They stumble over the corpses. Because of the multitude of harlotries of the seductive harlot, the mistress of sorceries who sells nations through her harlotries and families through her sorceries. Nineveh was a nasty city. And it was no place for a good Jewish boy to go and spend time. I mean, it, it makes sense that Jonah wouldn't want to go there. In fact, I have a feeling that Jonah probably figured that they deserved what they were going to get, right? So, you know, I'm, I'm driving down I-5, and I, I, you know, I was a cop for a short time, and they called me driving Miss Daisy because I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't drive over the speed limit. They were like, you're never going to catch that guy, you know. But, but so, you know, one day, I'm driving down the freeway. I've got my, my speedometer set at 65. This can't, happened recently. And this car from Washington, out of stater folks, you know, goes <laughs> flying by me down I-5. And I was just like, and, and I know that there's a spot where the state troopers like to hide just on the other side of this hill. And so I'm just watching. And I'm like, oh, they're going to get there. And sure enough, what do I see? I see the car go, you know, do the, the brake light thing. And there's a, there's a state trooper right there. And he pulls out and pulls the guy over. And as I'm driving by, I want to wave and honk my horn because he got what he deserved, right? <laughs> That's what Jonah's thinking, Okay. It's like, oh, those guys, they deserve what they're going to get, and I don't want to do anything. I don't want to wave at them and say, no, slow down. You know, judgment's coming. You better slow down. Don't do that. No, they just wave them on by, you know, and go see what happens. And then we wave as we see them being destroyed and being, being punished for their sin. Because it's wrong to drive over the speed limit. It is. <laughs> That's why God gave us cruise control. <sighs> So Jonah decides he's going to flee in the opposite direction. He looks at a map and he says, okay, Nineveh's right here. He's looking at a map of the known world. It's a little bit smaller than we have today. But he looks at Nineveh and he says, okay, what is the farthest point that I can get to from right here? And guess what that place is? It's Tarshish. 
you have to go across the Mediterranean Sea, through the Straits of Gibraltar, to the far side of modern-day Spain. Okay, this was not a little journey. This was a big thing, and it is literally as far as they knew that they could go at this point in time from Nineveh. And he says, that's where I'm going. I'm taken off. And so he goes down to Joppa, down to the seaport, and he finds a boat that's heading that way. He pays the fare. He goes down into the boat, and he's like, yes, I did it. I'm out of here. And you've probably heard it taught many times how it talks about how he went down to Joppa, and he went down into the boat to be able to flee. You know, it's this, it's this downward spiral as he's trying to escape from the Lord, you know, and it just, he thinks that he's, he's going to get away. Mission accomplished, right? No. Verse 4, it says, but the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. So the ship sets sail, and at some point along the voyage, we don't know how far into it it was, the Lord brings about a supernatural storm. He brings about a storm that is, is so powerful that it's going to stop Jonah in his tracks. He can't go any farther to get away from the Lord. You know, and, and Jonah knows the scriptures. He's a prophet of God, okay? He would surely know the Psalms. And there's a psalm, in fact, you may be familiar with it, Psalm 139, verse 7 to 9, it says this, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into the heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, you are there. Jonah knows this, right? And we know this. And yet, Jonah has this idea that he can hide from the Lord. And I think a lot of times we kind of have that thought too, right? What I'm doing over here, you can't tell. And I'm assuming the Lord can't see because I've got my hand over it. You know, and we have this idea in our minds that somehow we are different from everyone else and that we can hide what we're doing from the Lord. And yet everything that we do is naked and uncovered before him. And same way with Jonah. Jonah spent all this money and all this time to escape from the Lord, and now he's in a boat that is being broken into pieces because the Lord is saying, I can still see you, and I'm, I'm going to stop you right here. Verse 5, it says, Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God <clears throat> and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship. Remember that downward spiral. And he had lain down and was fast asleep. Now, it is safe for us to surmise that this was not an ordinary storm because we have hardened sailors, you know, guys that made their living on the sea, and they're crying out to their gods. Okay, they're having a prayer service up on deck, calling out to their different gods. And not only that, but they're now throwing their cargo into the sea. The only way that these guys would get paid is if they could deliver a cargo to another port. That's how they got paid, okay, was by making these deliveries. So it was a big enough deal to where they were willing to risk financial ruin in order to survive this storm. It was not a normal storm. It was a, it was a big deal. And, you know, <laughs> so you've got all this going on topside. They're throwing everything over. They're having their prayer meeting, calling out to their little G gods, and Jonah is down in the very bottom of the ship, and he's just sound asleep. Just, he's out. And Spurgeon, here's a quote from Spurgeon. <clears throat> says, Jonah was asleep amid all the confusion and noise. And, O oh, Christian man, for you to be indifferent to all that is going on in such a world as this, for you to be negligent of God's work in such a time as this, is just as strange. The devil alone is making noise enough to wake all of the Jonas, if only they wanted to awake. All around us there is tumult and storm, yet some professing Christians are able, like Jonah, to go to sleep in the sides of the ship. You know, Jonah, it's, it's like he doesn't even care. You know, and this is actually his fault. This ship is breaking up, and it's his fault. And we too... We can be so caught up in just sleeping, 
and just being, being asleep that we aren't paying attention to what's going on around us, that our brothers and sisters could use a hand, that there are people that need ministering too, and yet we are down in the bottom of a, of a ship that's breaking up and sleeping, completely asleep. Spiritually speaking, we are asleep. Verse 6, it says this, So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. So at some point during the storm, you know, the captain realizes Jonah is not taking part in the prayer circle. All the guys are up on, on deck. They're all calling out to their gods. They're trying to figure out what's going on. And they're missing somebody. And so the captain goes down and he finds Jonah asleep downstairs. And he says, hey, Jonah, what, what, what are you doing? Come up here. Call on your God. Here we have Jonah, the, the guy, the only one in the whole boat that is able to tell them. Like, here's what's going on. The only one that is actually a servant of the living God. The only one that has any, any direction for them at all. And he's sleeping down in the bottom of the boat. And so they drag him up on, up on deck. And verse 7 says, And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. They say, Okay, guys, get some straws. We're going we're gonna to draw straws, and whoever gets the short straw, that's the one. And we're going to know that that person is the one responsible for what's going on. And so they draw their straws, and the short straw falls on Jonah. Verse 8, it says, Then they said to him, Please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? So he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. So these guys, the, these sailors, they are so afraid. They're, they're convening this little mini court session, and they're, they're going into the deposition time, and they're asking all these questions. What is going on, Jonah? What, who are you? Where'd you come from? We need to know what's going on here, because we're all about ready to die. And Jonah tells them, he says, oh yeah, I serve the living God. The, I, I serve Jehovah. Not just Elohim, little gods, but I serve Jehovah, the God that actually made the sea and made the dry land. And I'm sure they're going, oh, great. You know, so now we've got, and they're probably thinking in their minds, the sea god, a sea god that we aren't aware of or something like that, which would make sense because the storm is, is blowing all over the place. And then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he told them. <laughs> so Jonah, you know, he's, he's sitting, and I can picture him as just a skinny little guy, you know, just, just this little tiny guy. And you've got all these big burly sailors standing around, and they're all scared. And he's like, oh, yeah, this is, this is all my fault. I was running from God. And, and they're all standing around, probably standing closer and closer, like, okay, so what are we supposed to do here? But they were super afraid because they realized that he was running from God. This God that was super powerful, unlike all the gods that they served. <sighs> so they were, they were scared. Verse 11, it says, Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? They don't say, What should we do that the sea may be calm? What should we do to you? <laughs> you know, as they're looking at Jonah, you know, and if you just picture in mind the skinny little guy with the, the big sailors, it makes a lot of sense. For the sea was growing more tempestuous. It was getting worse. The storm was, was continuing to grow. <laughs> so <laughs> Jonah said to him, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. See, Jonah knew that the storm was his fault. He knew that this was 100% because he had run from God, and he had put the lives of all these men in peril because of his sin, because he was fleeing from the Lord. 
anyone that tells you that they can sin in a vacuum and that it won't affect anyone else, it's not how it works. Our sin has consequences, not only for us, but for those that are closest to us. And Jonah was in a place where his sin was endangering the lives of every man on that ship. There were going to be consequences. So why did he offer himself up to be cast into the sea? You know, I, I kind of I contemplated that a little bit. Because if he's, if he's running from God, you know, okay, so the ship breaks up and we die. At least I don't have to go to Nineveh. You know, and maybe that's what he's saying is, well, at least, you know, I feel sorry for you guys. And so throw me in the sea, I'll die, and God will spare all of your lives. And that way, I still don't have to go to Nineveh. It's, we still win, right? Because he doesn't have to go. But it's all speculation at this point. Um, we do know that he said that he fears the Lord, okay? And that would speak of a reverential awe. That's uh, understanding, uh, having an understanding of who the Lord is and how mighty and powerful he is. And, you know, maybe he has already repented, it repented from, from running away and is like, okay, well, throw me in the sea and, you know, maybe God will give me a piece of driftwood or something like that, but you guys will at least be saved. We don't really know. Um, I don't think that he was quite at a place of true repentance yet, but the Lord knew what was going on and the Lord gave him the ability to be able to say, okay, well, if you throw me in the sea, you guys are going to be okay. Verse 13, it says, Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. As time is going on, the sea is continuing to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And these, you know, these sailors, they were good guys, okay? I mean, they hear Jonah say, throw me in the sea and you guys will be okay. And yet they still you know what, let's, let's just see if we can make it shore. And they, they ship the oars out, and they just start going, and they're going to town, but they aren't making any progress. They're not able to sail into this storm. It's too strong, and it's getting stronger by the moment. They didn't want to have to sacrifice Jonah's life. But for all their good intentions, they weren't a match for the Lord. The Lord was going to do the job that he had set out to do. He was going to get... Jonah's attention. He was going to have his will in their lives. Verse 14, it says, Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. These men, they've realized that they are powerless against the Lord. And they begin to cry out to the Lord. And they are crying out to Jehovah. They aren't crying out to Elohim, to, to their strange gods, their wooden and, and, and stone idols and things like that. They are crying out to the Lord, the same God that we worship. In the short time that Jonah was on deck with them, they had a come to God moment and were exposed to true power that they weren't able to see in any of their false idols. And so they cried out to the Lord and they said, Lord, <laughs> you know, we don't want to be guilty for an innocent man's blood. But we don't want to perish either. And at the end of the day, it's all your will. Whatever it is that you want to have happen, we're going to be okay with that. And they're, they're freaking out. <laughs> you know, at the very end, they, they realize that, that the Lord is going to do what he sets out to do. The Lord is stronger. The Lord's ways are not our ways. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, that says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, for my ways are not your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. These guys got a glimpse that the Lord was doing something that was beyond them, that they had no power to control. They could not manipulate the situation. They had done everything that they knew to do to get out of this tough situation, and they understood that they were in the hands of God and that his ways are above their ways. 
And so they picked up Jonah and they threw him in the sea. Verse 15, so they picked up Jonah and they threw him into the sea and the sea ceased from its ragings. Just like that, bam. They, they go, okay, everybody look, they all look at each other and they pick up Jonah and Jonah probably just kind of went limp and all right guys and, and one, two, are we letting him go on three? Okay, three and, and off the edge of the ship he went and the seas instantly stopped raging. The wind died down. Can you imagine their relief and their surprise? Because, you know, I mean, okay, so Jonah says that we can throw him in the sea and the, the storm will stop. But until they actually did that, did they really believe that it would just stop? I mean, had that ever happened in their lives before? I mean, the weather doesn't change that fast, even on the ocean. I mean, there's a, a slight build up and a build down, but this was supernatural. God just went poof. And all of a sudden, they're sitting there, and, you know, the sun came out, and, you know, if they had birds with them, they'd start tweeting, you know, and it's like, oh, wow, you know, this is, this is something else. But listen to this, verse 16. Then the men, the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. How cool is that? Jonah, super disobedient to the Lord running from the Lord, hiding out, almost causing the destruction in all these men's lives. And yet the Lord still did an amazing work in spite of him. And just with a few simple words that Jonah saying, I serve the Lord, the creator of the heavens and the earth. It was enough truth for these guys to realize that they needed to serve the Lord. And when it says that they feared the Lord exceedingly, this is, this is fear like I'm afraid, but even more so and most likely at this point because they've already had the fear and now things are calm, this is that reverential awe where they are going, oh my goodness, this is amazing. And they feared the Lord exceedingly. And it reminds me of, of Jacob. If you remember, he had the dream where the Lord appeared to him, right? And when he woke up, he says in verse 16 of chapter 20 of Genesis, then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. And he was afraid and he said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God and this is the gate of heaven. It's that, that point in our lives where we realize how big and awesome God is. And it should cause us to tremble a little bit, understanding how, how small and insignificant we are outside of, of him loving us, how completely just poof, we could be gone just like that. And we have this awe, this fear of God where we go, wow, you are holy. You are awesome. And we should be offering sacrifices to the Lord and turning and making vows to the Lord, saying, Lord, I want to follow you. And that's what these guys did. We had, we had a bunch of little, little converts. And this was all, even though Jonah was running from the Lord, disobeying the Lord, the Lord still took something that was, was really meant for evil and turned it into something good. You know, and, and that reminds me again, you know, looking back to Isaiah, and we already read it once, but 55 verse 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. The Lord's thoughts are not our thoughts. Nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And the thing is, guys, is that when the Lord asks us to do something and we choose to run away, and we say, Lord, no, uh, I, I can't do that. And we look back on those, on those times, and there, there should be some shame. You know, we, we know that we disobeyed the Lord. But understand that the Lord's ways are not our ways. That his plans are so much more than what we can even imagine. And even when we are in a time of rebellion, the Lord can still take something that was rebellious, and he can make it into something good. And we, we don't really know what that's going to look like until we walk through it. 
when we are willing to repent and turn and say, I serve the Lord. I fear the Lord. The heavens and the earth, the, the seas are made by him. People will turn and they will give glory to God. So we will not always be a good example. <laughs> Oftentimes we are not a great example of the Lord to those people around us. And yet, if we are willing to repent and to turn and to open our mouths and speak forth the truth of God, the Lord will do amazing things through the spoken word of God. It's not about us. We are broken vessels. We are we're nasty, yucky people. As Pastor Phil used to say, dirty, rotten, sinners, <laughs> saved by grace, right? And so we, we have this revival that takes place on the boat. So Jonah has been tossed into the sea. And in verse 17, it says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. You know, and it's interesting because we look at Jonah and, and Jonah's been thrown into the sea. You know, and he begins to sink down through the water. And this, this giant fish comes up and, and just swallows him whole, okay? And, you know, it's not like Jonah is saying these things, like, throw me in the sea, and God's like, oh, crud, I got I to gotta pull, gotta put a fish over there. I got to do something so that I can rescue Jonah. You know, that's, that's not how it works with the Lord. The Lord is outside of time. He had already prepared a great fish to be able to take Jonah, Lord, the Lord, in his foreknowledge of all the things that are happening, including all of our free will and all of that, God's ways are so much higher than ours that he had already prepared this great fish to be able to swallow Jonah whole and to be able to make it so that he could live inside this fish for three days and for three nights. And so for us, guys, the Lord knows that we are imperfect people. He knows that we are stiff-necked at times. Um, he knows that we are disobedient. And yet, the Lord has made provision to save us. He has prepared the path for us to walk in. Even when we are doing foolish things, the Lord cares about us. Philippians 2.13 says this, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Our lives, they don't belong to us. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, your life belongs to him. And the entire purpose of our lives is to bring glory to him, to do his good pleasure. And from time to time, you will wander off. I will wander off. But understand that the Lord has a great fish ready to swallow you whole, to let you spend three days in the stinky fish smell until you truly repent and get barfed back up on the shore and get another shot at it. The Lord has called each and every one of us. And he has put his Holy Spirit in our lives to give us the power to do the things that he's called us to do. What is the Nineveh that the Lord has called you to go preach at? That you're like, oh, I, I don't want to do that. I really don't want to do that. I mean, you can, you can I, at least it's this way with me. If I ask the Lord, you know, what sin is in my life? All of a sudden he's like, oh, this one, this one, this one. <laughs> okay, even if I thought I was doing well. And if I ask the Lord, what is it that you wanted me to do that I haven't been doing? I can guarantee you he's going to show me. And I'll bet you he'd do it for all of you guys too. The Lord has something specific for each and every one of us that he's calling us to do, to do his good will his, for his pleasure. That's what we are called to do. And if you are in rebellion right now, repent. Turn back to the Lord because that's how it all works out. And that's how people are going to come to know Jesus too. Amen? Amen. All right. So we're going to take communion now. Um, if there are things in your life right now where you're just like, man, I have been running from the Lord, I would, I would encourage you, I would exhort you, that's encouragement with a stick, I would exhort you strongly to 
confess your sin to the Lord, to repent from that, and then to come and take communion, knowing that you are in a right place with the Lord. And then let's see what the Lord does through your obedience. Amen? Jesus, you endured my pain. The Savior, you bore all my shame. All because of your love. The maker of the universe. The broken for the sins of the earth. All because of your love, all because of your love, because of your cross, my dead is paid, because of your blood, my sins are washed away, now all of my life. Freely give because of your love, because of your love, I live. Innocent, holy king. Innocent, holy king. You died set the captive free all because of your love and Lord you gave your life for me so I will live my life for you all because of your love and all because because of your love, because of your cross, my dead is faith, because of your blood, my sins are washed away. Now all of my life I freely gave, because of your love, because of your your victory Jesus you are enough you did it for me you did it for love it's your victory Jesus you are enough you did it for me you did it for love it's your victory and Jesus you are enough
seated above, throned in the Father's love. Your destined to die, poured out for all mankind. In God's own Son, perfectly spotless one. He never sinned, suffered as if he did. And all authority, every victory is yours. It's all authority, every Riding this broken land, it's all authority. It's all authority. Every victory is yours. It's all authority. Every Jesus, awesome and powerful forever, awesome. 
come and greet is your name. Lord, I thank you for your blood. Thank you that you shed your blood for us, even though we fell just like Jonah did, even though we sometimes run away from you, Lord. Pray that we may uh, just grow more in you, Lord, and uh, strive to be the best that we can. Pray that we may imitate you the best that we can, Lord. Give us the strength we need to finish out this week. Pray that we may focus on you. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen.